Apigenin increases muscle mass and function. Let's have a look at that data. So first we're looking at a study in very young uh, male mice. In this case they were five weeks old, which is equivalent to a uh, toddler, a uh, four-year-old toddler. So uh, they supplemented the mice with uh, two different levels of abigenin, uh, in this case 0.2% and 0.4% when compared with a normal diet that did not contain abigenin. And this was a seven-week study and uh, it was a low-fat diet. So 5% of the total calories came from fat, 16% came from protein. So uh, first we're looking at the weight of the uh, uh, quadriceps, which are muscles located on the front of the thigh. We can see that when compared with animals that were not supplemented with apigenin, uh, apigenin supplementation, both low and high, increased muscle mass. So uh, when, it, when muscle mass is increased, it's important to look at the tissue weights uh, other than muscle uh, because if body size increases, is it a muscle-specific effect? So in this uh, case, there was no difference in body weight or the weight of the heart, liver, or fat depots. So interestingly, one could, one could conclude that apigenin selectively improved muscle mass in this study. So what about uh, physical function? So one measure of function is uh, treadmill running distance, so essentially running to exhaustion on a treadmill. So uh, for a mice that were uh, not supplemented with apigenin, so NOR, normal diet, compared with the two apigenin groups, we can see that apigenin supplementation uh, uh, resulted in uh, longer running distances for the mice. So from this, we can conclude that apigenin improves muscle mass and uh, treadmill uh, uh, run distance. Now, um, mouse studies are interesting, but what's the human equivalent dose that could potentially replicate these findings in people? So um, the short answer is 1.2 grams. So how did we get there? Let's derive the human equivalent dose. So first, uh, in just looking at the low dose apigenin group, 0.2%, that translates into 0.2 grams of apigenin per 100 grams of food. Now mice eat about three grams of food per day, so when you multiply these values, you get uh, six milligrams or 0 0.006 grams of apigenin were consumed per day. Now the mice weighed 28 grams at the end of the study, so then we can identify a, a uh, dose, uh, you know, in milligrams of uh, apigenin consumed per kilogram body weight uh, by dividing. So uh, six, mil six milligrams divided by 28 uh, 0.028 kilograms equals uh, 0.21 grams of apigenin consumed per kilogram body weight uh, per day. So 210 milligrams of apigenin per kilogram body weight. Now, uh, we then need to use the body size conversion from mice to humans. So for that, we divide by 12.3 as I've highlighted here on the right. So when we divide 0.21 grams of apigenin per kilogram body weight by 12.3, we get a, a, a an equivalent dose of 0 0.017 grams of apigenin per kilograms of body weight. So then taking my body weight, for example, 71 kilograms, we multiply that by the 0 0.017 grams of apigenin per kilogram body weight, and we get to the 1.2 grams of apigenin per day as the human equivalent dose for what was used in the mouse study on the previous slide. Now that's a lot. So are there any other studies that have demonstrated an, uh, an impact for apigenin on muscle? So uh, in this study, apigenin once again positively affected uh, muscle cross-sectional area, so essentially the size of each individual muscle fiber was increased and improved treadmill running distance, but in this case it was young mice that weren't on a low-fat diet, it was on a high-fat diet. And that's uh, interesting and important because uh, it could be that you know a macronutrient composition uh, impacts apigenin supplementation. So what this data shows is it doesn't matter if you're on a low-fat or a high-fat diet, or at least for mice. Uh, that apigenin can improve muscle-related measures independent of the diet composition. So let's look. Let's have a look at their, uh, these data. So what we're looking at on the left is uh, a muscle cross-section. So it's essentially a two two-dimensional representation of uh, individual muscle fibers uh, for the normal diet on the top, the high-fat diet in the middle, and then high-fat di diet plus apigenin. And in this case, they supplemented the mice with 0.1%. So uh, half of the lowest dose of the previous study. So when looking at the individual muscle fibers, which are the red areas, so I've uh, starred them, just a couple of them to highlight those are individual muscle fibers, and the muscle that they looked at was the gastrocnemius, so essentially the calf muscle on the lower leg. So when comparing the cross-sectional area uh, uh, in the gastrocnemius on, normal, on the normal diet, high-fat diet had a smaller muscle cross-sectional area as indicated by the stars, but then when they supplemented the animals with apigenin on the high-fat diet, we can see a small but uh, you know, a significant increase in 
uh, muscle cross-sectional area. So they, besides the visual representation of the individual muscle uh, 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 cross-sectional areas in response to apigenin or not, uh, they quantify these data in a chart, and that's what we see here. So uh, when compared to the cross-sectional areas, CSA, on the normal diet, NOR, we can see that the high-fat diet fed mice had a uh, smaller muscle cross-sectional area, so smaller individual muscle fibers. But then uh, apigenin supplementation on the high-fat diet resulted in an increased muscle cross-sectional area. So uh, individual muscle fiber area is, is interesting, but uh, function may be more relevant. So to assess that, they ran mice on a treadmill to exhaustion uh, and then measured running distance. So that was, that's, that's what we're looking at here on the, uh, on the right. And what we can see is that mice on a high-fat diet ran a significantly shorter dif distance compared to the normal diet, which was not a high-fat diet. Oh, I should have mentioned in this case, this was a 60% fat diet, 20% protein, uh, and it was an eight-week study in 22-week-old uh, male mice. So once again, they didn't use females, which is a major limitation, because then it's unknown if these data would apply to women, since none of the studies looked at uh, female mice. Uh, and the, uh, so these data in 22-week-old mice are equivalent to about a 17-year-old in, in human years. All right, so treadmill running distance, we can see that the high-fat diet, there's a lower, uh, uh, they, they ran a, a shorter distance, but then apigenin supplementation on the high-fat diet, they ran a longer distance. So uh, what's the human equivalent dose based on these data? Um, so uh, using a simil similar calculation before and uh, a little bit bigger mice because on a high-fat diet, it's an obesogenic diet, meaning the animals gain more weight uh, more quickly. So the animals weren't 28 grams at the end of the study as in the previous uh, slide. In this case, they were 50 grams at the uh, end of the study. So when incorporating that data into the human equivalent dose, HED, we get 346 milligrams per day for a 71 kilogram person. So uh, about a threefold reduction compared to the data on the previous slide in terms of how much apigenin may impact muscle. So we're getting pretty close to um, uh, a level of apigenin that potentially can be impacted through diet and or uh, supplementation. All right, now data in young mice is interesting, but what about during aging? Uh, so uh, that's what we're going to see here in this study. And in this case, uh, giving away, you know, the slide is uh, the slide's data is apigenin increases muscle mass, strength, and treadmill running distance, and also reduces frailty in old mice. So first they compared young and old. So what were the ages of those mice? So young was uh, were uh, six to nine month old animals, which is uh, um, equivalent to people that are in the 20 to 31 year age range. And then old were 16 old mice, or what they called old was 16 month old mice, uh, maximum lifespan in the animal. Uh, the mice that they use is uh, around 36 months, so 16 months is closer to middle age than, than old. But besides the you know the definition of their uh, uh, their definition of old, it's a uh, it's approximately middle age. And once again, they also use data for males. They didn't look at these uh, apigenin supplementation in females, which is again a major limitation because. Uh, you know, having data to uh, apply it to only one gender and not another, you know, it's half the population. So, all right. So then what doses of apigenin did they supplement? So they gave 25, 50, and 100 milligrams per kilogram of apigenin. Now, in the first two slides, the apigenin was provided in the food or the drinking water. And that can induce variability in how much apigenin is consumed because if mice uh, individual mice consume more or less food, they're consuming more or less apigenin. And, and you know, similarly, if you drink more or less water, you're going to have some variability in the apigenin that you consume. So in this case, they provided the apigenin by, uh, uh, via uh, intragastric administration, which is essentially they're injecting it down their throat. So not pleasant, but that's what they did. All right, so what was the impact of apigenin on um, muscle-related measures in old mice? So first, we're looking at muscle weight divided by body weight. And again, it's important to divide by body weight because if uh, muscle weight and body size are both increased, it may not be a muscle specific effect. It's just an overall increase in body size. So first in looking at, um, oh, well, so again, I should mention which muscles did they look at? They looked at the tibialis anterior, the extensor digitoris longum, EDL, and then the soleus, sole. And I've, I've highlighted in the little cartoon on the right, the little picture on the right, uh, that these are lower uh, uh, muscles. Uh, th these are lower, le lower leg muscles. All right, so uh, first, during aging, there was an age-related decline in the muscle weight to body weight ratio, which is well known. I mean, that's been documented in very many, many studies. Um, so each of these muscles saw an age-related decline in this ratio, muscle weight divided by body weight. So what about the impact of apigenin in the old mice? 
So we can see that the two highest doses for the tibialis anterior, TA, resulted in a higher muscle weight to body weight ratio. And then similarly, the middle doses, 50 milligrams per kilogram of apigenin, increased the muscle weight to body weight ratio for both the EDL and soleus. So what about muscle function? So to assess that, they looked at grip strength and uh, treadmill running distance. So first, when looking at grip strength, we can see that, again, there's an age-related reduction in uh, muscle strength, which is well, well documented. It's, that's been shown you know, lots of times before. But then old mice supplemented with each dose of abigenin, 25, 50, and 100 milligrams per kilogram of body weight, each uh, significantly improved their grip strength. So what about tre treadmill running distance? So again, age-related decline, red line, and then the two highest uh, apigenin groups, uh, 50 and 100 milligrams per kilogram, had increased uh, treadmill run, run distance. So uh, epigenin improves muscle mass and aerobic capacity. Now, what about frailty? So um, to assess frailty, they used a, a composite of 31 different measures, uh, one of those measures being muscle, muscle function, but there were other measures too, cognitive and, and, and other measures that were included in the uh, 31, um, <clears throat> 31, assess, uh, 31 assessments of uh, combined assessments for frailty. Sorry. So, okay, first when looking at the old mice, we can see that they had the highest frailty score with the black line. But then the, the two, apigenin uh, uh, at 50 and 100 milligrams per kilogram uh, of body weight, significantly reduced this frailty score. So important data, uh, potentially for older adults. So, um, okay, so how does this translate into uh, a human equivalent dose? So for the, just using the 50 milligrams per kilogram uh, dose as a reference, but mostly because that was the, uh, the dose, the lowest dose that uh, displayed consistent effects for both muscle mass and uh, muscle function, uh, the human equivalent dose would be uh, 288 milligrams per day for a 71 kilogram person. Also factoring in the uh, body size, you know, uh, the body size, um, com uh, accounting for body size from mice to humans divided by 12.3. So 50 divided by 12.3 multiplied by 71 gives you 288 milligrams per day. So can we get 288 milligrams per day of apigenin from food? I mean, my preference is to get it all from food. Some may get it from supplements. Um, so, uh, but can we get it from food? So first, dried parsley has more than 4,500 milligrams of apigenin per 100 grams of, of dried parsley. So to get 288 milligrams using dried parsley, you would need 6.4 grams per day. Not too bad. Uh, so what about fresh parsley? Um, so fresh parsley has 215 uh, uh, and a half milligrams of apigenin per 100 grams of food. And to get to the 288 milligrams per day of apigenin that uh, was a human equivalent dose potentially uh, to get those muscle-related effects in the last study, we would need about 134 grams per day, so about five ounces of fresh parsley a day. Uh, now, chamomile tea is pretty popular, too, uh, for uh, having apigenin, but I looked at the actual studies for uh, the tea, not necessarily the extract of the chamomile, le uh, uh, you know, the chamomile plant or leaves, um, which can be alcoholic extract, it can be water-based extract, um, uh, can be other, uh, you know, uh, fat-based extracts. So when I looked at the actual tea, how much is in it with, in published studies, uh, there's a, a lot of variability in how much apigenin is in chamomile tea. In one study, 91 milligrams of apigenin per 500 mil, uh, mils was found. Uh, and um, so that's about two, six, uh, one 16-ounce cup of uh, chamomile tea would have 91 milligrams of apigenin. So you'd need about 1.6 liters to get to this 288 milligrams per day of apigenin. However, in another study, there was significantly less apigenin found in the chamomile tea, and it ranged uh, depending on the source, you know, uh, which, which version of chamomile tea uh, that, they, that they analyzed. So they analyzed like uh, 13 different chamomile teas. So the range for apigenin in those teas was as low as 1 to as high as 24, 23 and a half milligrams per 500 mils. So using the median value for that, about 12 milligrams of apigenin per 500 mils, you would need a lot of chamomile tea. I mean, 6,000 liters. So there's no way you can get that much epigenin. So there's a lot of variability in the epigenin data in terms of chamomile tea. So I wouldn't use that as the primary source uh, to try to boost epigenin levels in the diet, just when considering there's so much variability in how much chamomile tea can actually have. Now, so as a last note, it's important to know that there are no active randomized controlled trials in people that have evaluated whether epigenin supplementation can actually affect muscle uh, in, in either young or older adult humans. So whether or not the mouse data will translate into people, for now that's unknown. All right, that's all I've got for now. Uh, if you made it to the end, thanks a lot. I uh, hope you enjoyed the video and have a great day.